Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm sorry for that uh, delay, which not, was not caused by us, uh, but welcome to, anyway, welcome to the second uh, IODP-related uh, media conference. Um, this one um, is about a project which was run in 2010, uh, about one year ago. It was the Great Barrier Reef Environmental Changes Expedition. This was a European contribution to the IODP, to the Integrated Ocean Drilling Program. And I'm uh, really very happy to have two colleagues who were on that expedition. Uh, on the one hand, uh, staff uh, scientist uh, Carol Cotterill. She's working with BGS in Edinburgh. Staff scientist, that is a kind of managing the scientist on board and offshore, Carol. <laughs> Very, very hard work, uh, actually, uh, onshore and offshore. The reason is that uh, these European expeditions have, they call, we call them mission-specific platform operations, because we do not have a real research vessel, but a kind of platform, a very small vessel, so to say. Uh, minimal science is done on board, but uh, at the end, two months or th four months or so after each expedition, we have a science party going on, the real science party, so to say, uh, which takes place um, in Bremen in the IODP core repository. And um, next to uh, Carol is uh, Thomas Felis, my co colleague from Bremen. Uh, he's working with corals because this, of course, was a coral expedition, fossil corals. And um, Thomas will uh, tell about uh, some first results. So he was on the expedition onshore and offshore, of course. So Carol, just go ahead and tell us a little bit. It was not that easy to get that <laughs> organized uh, and get that running, So, but it was a very exciting thing, I think. So go ahead, please. Yes, it, it's a very exciting project still to be involved with. One of the first stages of the expedition was to actually go offshore and collect the corals. And we used the ship called the Great Ship Maya. Mm -hmm. We sailed from Townsville in Australia on the 11th of February and we returned into Townsville 55 days later. Um, so it was quite a long expedition, quite a long time to be on the vessel. N things don't go smoothly necessarily when you're working offshore. Um, and we had, we had an idea that things might, there might be a few gremlins in the project um, when, we, when we first arrived and we first started the mobilisation. Our aims, our objectives, were, to, were threefold. We wanted to look at the course of the post-glacial sea, sea level rise at the Great Barrier Reef. One of the reasons for choosing this location is that it's tectonically stable. So any changes in sea level are going to be the result of eustatic or global sea level change and not necessarily from tectonics. We wanted to look at sea, uh, variations in sea surface temperature and also salinities over the period from 10,000 to 20,000 years ago. And another objective for the scientists was to look at the impact of sea level changes on the reef growth and the reef geometry. And if by looking into the past and archives of the past, can we actually start to understand what might happen in the future? But when we went out to Singapore in January 2010, supposedly to meet a brand new drill ship that had come out from the dry dock, that was what we were presented with. And in the space of a month, we actually managed to turn her into a working drill ship. So there was um, quite a lot of concern there, but, but through good working sort of conditions and working with our colleagues and the drilling contractors in this, we managed to get the drill ship operational. The second challenge that we had is what do you do when you have not one but two cyclones coming towards you? Um, as you can see from there, one is a satellite image of Cyclone Alui and Cyclone Thomas. Um, and the bottom image is the path of the cyclone and also the extent of the winds, the strong winds. And you can see there are some yellow pins put in there, which are actually our coring sites. So we cored at three different geographic locations. We had hoped that the cyclone would swing further south, which might free up the northernmost location, but in actual fact, it stopped operations for 10 days completely. And then challenge number three was the weather, and it was not just bad weather, but good weather. At times, as you can see from the thermometer here that we put onto the drill floor, we actually hit 52 degrees centigrade, and trying to work in those conditions when you're in boiler suits, sort of sheepskin-lined steel toe cap boots and hard hats is quite difficult. 
but again you work through it and it's 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 looking after these challenges as well as the actual coring that you have to go through the drill floor layout because of the uh, the way that mission specific platforms work we work on a system of containers that we ship around the world and we put onto whatever boat is best suited for our purposes so you can see here the number of turquoise containers and we try and arrange the labs so that the core has a minimal distance to travel and that we're not carrying it up and down stairs, we're not disturbing it at all. So we're moving smoothly from one to the other. But as you can see it's quite cramped conditions for people to be working in. The, uh, the uh, measurements that are done offshore, as Albert mentioned, are quite limited. We have curation of the cores, which is the most important stage. We need to curate the cores properly so, and so that they can be transported back and looked at later on by the whole science party. But we do some minimal measurements there because that will aid whether we continue drilling in that hole, whether we stop that hole because we've hit our target and move on to the next one, and also what type of lithologies we're going through. Are they what we expected or do we need to change our site locations? So we're constantly assessing on board the lithology that's coming up, the preservation, the type of corals, the sediments that are coming up so that we can actually modify our drilling program as we go. And in addition, we collect samples that can't be kept until we get back to the lab. So interstitial water collection is undertaken from suitable cores. We run uh, all the cores through a multi-sensor core logger, which looks at the physical properties of the cores, which again helps identify lithologic boundaries so that we can immediately look at some data, some basic data, and see how the coring is going. And then all the cores are put into a refrigerated container at a controlled 4 degrees centigrade, and that's where they stay when they're shipped back until they're unloaded back at the IODP core repository in Bremen. So roughly... Uh, Two, two and a half months after we came back onshore in Australia, we had the onshore science party in Bremen and all the cores were laid out in the reef at the core repository for, for the science party to get an initial overview. We then undertake a number of stages, especially when dealing with massive corals that are very important for the paleoclimate studies. They have to be split ideally along the growth of axis, which more often than not isn't half and half on the core. So we have to photograph them in situ first. We then got permission to split the cores unevenly if we needed to, to so that these massive corals were split along their growth axis. And we photograph them during that time and then again afterwards. And then we undertake a detailed des description of all the cores. So the sedimentologists will review the cores, coral specialists will review the cores, foram specialists will have a look at the samples and identify what are in there. Everything that goes together to start building up the picture. We take very high resolution digital line scans that can then be put onto, if you can see in the bottom right hand photograph, there's a system called Coralizer, which is the, the line scans are the first thing that is done and those images are then available for the specialist to zoom in on or to look at what the core before was like or maybe to look at the core afterwards so that they can get a sense of where the core they're studying at the moment sits in the whole succession. And this is also where the sampling is done as well for all the post-cruise research that goes on. So in summary for the operations side, we acquired 191.34 metres of core from the fossil reef sites but we also um, went to a four reef slope site and acquired an additional 33 metres there, which will help give us evidence of the sediment runoff or erosion from the, the reefs as they were undergoing drowning. The operations were all carried out without any environmental impact on the modern reef system. e worked very closely with the Great Barrier, Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority in, in putting together an environmental management plan. Before we cored any site, we would drop the drill pipe down to just above the seafloor and we would put a camera down, we'd view it. If there are any live corals at all, we would move to another location. We also had um, what's called an LBV, a little benthic vehicle. It's like an ROV that we put down and we took imagery around the drill pipe. We looked at, to make sure that we weren't affecting the modern day reef system in, in any way at all. And in total, over 6,000 samples were taken for future research, covering a wide range of disciplines from paleoclimate work, paleomagnetism, microbiology, geochemistry, biology. So it's a whole range of disciplines and scientists that are now working on the cores that were collected. And at that point, I hand over to Thomas, who is one of the scientists. Okay. 
Okay, so I will introduce first a little bit the, the scientific topics of the expedition again. So what you see here is a record of sea level variations over the past 600,000 years. And uh, what we see here is that these sea level variations are based on marine sediment cores, but there's a much better way to reconstruct past sea level, recon uh, sea level varia variations, that is to look at fossil corals, fossil coral reefs, and to date them. And IODP expedition 325 focused on the last deglaciation, which is the last deglacial sea level rise, which occurred from the end of the large, la last ice age, 25,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. So this is indicated here by the red box. And this last sea level rise, you have to imagine during the last ice age, the global sea level was about 120 meters below present sea level, and all the seawater was stored in the form of ice on the continents. And this last sea level ri rise is really a key to understand global ice sheet dynamics and abrupt climate change. And up to now, there are only a very few sea level reconstructions based on corals, which are very accurate, but only one extends back into the last glacial maximum. This is the one from Barbados, but Barbados is a tectonical, not stable site. So the expedition tried to understand and to reconstruct in unprecedented accuracy the sea level rise of the last deglaciation. Another topic of the expedition was to, well, to recover information on past variability of the so-called El Nino Southern Oscillation. What is shown here is the impact of the last strong La Nina 2010-2011 on Australian rainfall. So this long, uh, very strong La Nina event uh, led to strong rainfall along the coast of the Great Barrier Reef in Queensland. And you see on the right bottom panel a river plume reaching almost the Great Barrier Reef. This is another image from January 2011. And such flood events, which are related to a global climate phenomenon, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, are then recorded by the Great Barrier Reef corals. And this was also a topic, one of the major topics of the expedition. So this is a bathymetric image of the Great Barrier Reef area. So to the upper left, you see the Australian continent, and then you see terraces in water depth up to 130 meters. And we knew before that there were these terraces at this depth, but due to the expedition and the course recovered, we can now really say these shelf edge, edge features, which were before the expedition identified with multi-beam bathymetry, that these are definitely fossil coral reefs. And I will give you some examples later. And if coral reefs a coral reef needs really light to grow. So these corals grow in symbiosis with algae, and you find coral reefs living for uh, coral reefs only in the upper 40 meters or 30 meters of the water column. So if you find a fossil coral reef in a depth of 130 meters below modern sea level, uh, and you date these corals, then this age of the corals gives you the information at that time the sea level must have been 130 meters below modern sea level. And this is how sea level reconstruction works. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef IODP expedition drilled a lot of massive fossil corals. I will highlight here one genus, which is Isopora cuneata, better known as the Acropora palmata of the Indo-Pacific. You see how this massive carbonate coral looks in the modern Great Barrier Reef. So it's a coral which is precipitating a carbonate skeleton. And you can then date these corals by mass spectrometry, get an age. And because we know that these acropora corals are really typical for very, very, very shallow reach, uh, reef settings, uh, this tells us something about the past sea level. On the right, you see such massive corals in the fossil world drilled by the IODP expedition. And these massive corals have another advantage. They can capture snapshots of past ocean, surface ocean conditions uh, at the time of growth. So if you 
analyze such a cover along its growth axis, you can really reconstruct with geochemical proxies temperature and salinity variations in monthly resolution. And for instance, you can reconstruct past flood events like this La Nina-related flood in Queensland in January 2011. And so this is a geological profile of the drill transect. I will give one example for this central drill profile and will show some photos how this looks. So this drill core at the top, which is already 90 meters below sea level, shows the typical, we say, coralgal bound stone. So it's a mixture of corals, massive corals, and algae crust, red algae crust. In the middle then, at 98 meters below sea level, you see coralgal bound stone and also microbialites. And at the bottom, we are already at 129 meters below sea level, deep in the sediment. We see unlithified sediments and, and so-called pack stone. And this material has been dated, and we have preliminary dating results indicating that IODP Expedition 325 really was able to recover coral material from the last glacial, and the last glacial maximum, which is a time of about 19 to 20, 23,000 years ago. And uh, this is quite unique, because until yet, uh, such coral reef material was only available, available from Barbados. The top panel shows, the graph shows the sea level reconstruction over the past 100 or oh, no, 35,000 years. And you see this curve, which starts at zero and goes down, is very dense if you go back in time, back to about 15 kilo years ago, 15,000 years ago. But then if, when this curve reaches the LGM, last glacial maximum, you only see a very few dots. And at the bottom, that's the important thing, are the ages, the preliminary ages of massive corals dated as part of the onshore science work here. And uh, you see all these ages fall within this critical interval of the last glacial ma maximum. And even better, they seem to provide a continuous record from 10,000 years ago to 25,000 years ago. And this is wonderful material to reconstruct in a very high resolution the last deglacial sea level rise and also to get high resolution climate information on phenomena like the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So these recovered fossil coral reef cores span really key periods of sea level and climate change. So just to summarize our preliminary scientific results, so IODP Expedition 325 was able to recover a complete sequence of fossil coral reef material from the last glacial maximum, about 23,000 years ago, through the last deglaciation up to 10,000 years ago. And the coral material recovered is mostly a corpora-dominated coral material. And this indicates very shallow reef settings and is wonderful suited to, to reconstruct sea level. Uh, we also have many massive corals and we expect high resolution snapshots of oceanographic conditions at the time of growth, so monthly resolved temperature and salinity reconstructions. And just to end with a statement that the expedition really was able to recover coral reef material from very exciting time intervals for sea level and climate change re reconstruction. And the ongoing work of the international team on the IODP Expedition 325 core material will address <coughs> outstanding questions in global climate and sea level histories since the last glacial maximum. Yeah, thank you, Carol, uh, Carol and Thomas. Um, I just have a question, short question. You mentioned that the meltwater pulses, yeah. uh, so periods where the sea level rose uh, quite rapidly. Um, and one of you mentioned uh, drowning reefs. Is your impression that there were periods where, where the sea level rose that quickly that the uh, reefs, the, the living reefs, were drowning? Is that an impression you get from your first results there? 
to make a final statement on, on that, we, we would need to wait for all the other datings. But it seems that the, the Great Barrier Reef was trying to catch up with the sea level rise, and, and sometimes it was not possible anymore. And, uh, but overall, it was backstepping up the continental slope. Yeah. So Just as a first uh, impression, so to say, yeah. not as a scientific result. Would you like to add something? or? Only that um, in in the work that was done as the, the the study before we went out and actually called the Great Barrier Reef, there is evidence that there have been reef drowning events on the Great Barrier Reef, but it wasn't known for certain whether these were actual events or whether this was due to the amount of data that was available or the the quality of the data that was available beforehand. So I think we we have proved with the the very basic. Um, the, the plot that Thomas was shown it was gauged from sort of 69 preliminary dating results that we collected and that we sort of rushed, th not rushed through, that were processed before the onshore science party. We're now currently working on over 4,000 more samples to get 4,000 more dates. And so we'll be able to tie whether there were reef drowning events mm. and these that were a result of these potential meltwater pulse sort of global phenomena much more accurately. People think at the moment that maybe there were these reef drowning events, but we'll definitely be able to prove one way or the other as the results of this expedition. Mm. I mean, th this will be an interesting question to answer uh, in the light of the current uh, sea level, accelerated sea level rise, I think. So we are looking forward to get some more results from, from that side. But I would like to open the floor for questions from your side. Maybe uh, there are some or one or two. Uh, maybe if there is any, uh, please uh, use the microphone which the colleague is just preparing and I hope it's working. Yes, it is. So any question? Yeah. Holger. Uh, Holger Kroker. Uh, do you record any uh, local influence, uh, local um, meltwater pulse uh, at that coral site or is this you only to uh, global sea water, uh, sea level rise? <laughs> uh, n during the last ice age, there were, were not really significant glaciers in Australia or in Queensland. So when we are talking about sea level rise and meltwater pulses, we are thinking about uh, fresh water which is coming from Antarctica, but also from the northern North Atlantic, from Greenland, from the inland ice masses of uh, northern Europe and uh, northern northern US, so we are talking about global global meltwater pulses. But it's a big question. Uh, meltwater pulses are known, but it's, it's a big topic, or it's really a topic of debate, which is the source of, for instance, uh, meltwater pulse 1A. Was it mostly Greenland, the North Atlantic, or Antarctica? And there's a lot of research going on uh, yeah, to to reconstruct these variations and also the source of the meltwater. One of the reasons for choosing the Great Barrier Reef as the, the site to go and undertake this coring to look at this question was that it would be able to be applicable globally. So it wasn't it wouldn't purely be localized effects that we would be looking at because it's tectonically stable and because it's what we call a far field site. So as Thomas said, it's it's away from the influence of local glacier or you know melting from ice sheets. This was this is a prime reason for choosing this site so that we could then apply what we find to a global context. To what extent it could uh, work as a uh, correction to Barbados, where where the, is this a uh, local influence discussed from okay. the Laurentide? Not necessarily a correction to, but it will be a supplement to. Um, it, it might it might be something that in the future you could potentially look at the results from the Great Barrier Reef and then start to to work out at other sites, okay, how much is a is the tectonic influence, how much is the actual global sea level influence, and start to untie the sort of combination of signals that you get in other sites. And as far as I understand, Thomas, uh, Barbados does not go that far back into time as does, um, as does the Great Barrier material, uh, right? Yeah, it goes back until 20,000 years ago or so. But the most important thing is Barbados might be biased by tectonic movements of the island because you have a subduction zone. But by having Barbados 
and the Great Barrier Reef, uh, you have something like, like a guide. You can use this information from both locations to detect the source of, for instance, Meltwater Pulse 1A better. Okay, Kirin. Um, yeah, two little questions. Firstly, uh, do, do you have an idea when we might see the first results uh, published? And B, can you explain in a few sentences what we can possibly learn from, uh, from this sea level reconstruction in terms of future sea level rise? Mm. Near, near term, of course. I mean, sea level rise in the next 100 years or so, or if, if, if anything. The, uh, addressing the first part, the first question, the IODP expedition report, which is what used to be known as the proceedings volume, will be published online in July of this year. And that has very detailed lithologic descriptions, very details of the corals that were found in each particular section, the type of forams, and, and some of the sort of initial paleomagnetism results. Um, is this peer reviewed? Or? It, it's, it's peer reviewed to the extent that it's the whole science party reviews it. Um, we have a, a week-long meeting in America where we, we go over everything that has been written and it's, it's read a total of six times by six different people so that we, we do peer review it within the science party, which is made up of a, rate, you know, a number of people from different disciplines. So that will be published in July of this year. And then there are um, specific high-impact papers that we're looking to publish between October and November of this year. Um, and one of those will be uh, a paleoclimate work, one will be sea level rise and reef response. So we're looking at getting the first initial results out and that sort of time scale. But obviously after that there will be a lot more results coming out. I should explain to you that Kirin Schirmeyer is the nature correspondent, correspondent working in Munich. So uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was a good answer uh, to his question. So Kirin, we are looking forward to your comments to nature articles, news and views and so on and so on. But you had a um, second question. Thomas, uh, would you take that? Yeah, what can we learn about, about future sea level rise? I mean, climate model projection, projections indicate that sea level will rise quickly in the future under global warming. And what we are trying to learn from these reconstructions is really uh, how fast, how rapid sea level can rise. Uh, for instance, during these meltwater pulses, which, yeah, due to this wonderful material we have when we have dated all these corals, we can really reconstruct these meltwater pulses in a very high resolution and then maybe getting to conclusions that sea level at that time during the last glaciation was able to rise for 10 meters or so within a few hundred years. And we are expecting information like this really on, on the rapidness of sea level rise from this data. All right. We have uh, time for one more question, if there is any. Well, if this is not the case, then uh, thank you very much for your participation uh, on both sides of this desk here. Thank you very much. And uh, so we are looking forward to some high-level papers uh, in the very near future. Thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was a good thing, wasn't it? <laughs>